أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل اللهم مالك الملك توت الملك من تشاء وتنزع الملك من من تشاء وتعز من تشاء وتذل من تشاء بيدك الخير إنك على كل شيء قدير تولج الليل في النهار وتولج النهار في الليل وتخرج الحي من الميت وتخرج الميت من الميت من الحي وترزق من تشاء بغير حساب لا يتخذ المؤمنون الكافرين أولياء من دون المؤمنين ومن يفعل ذلك فليس من الله في شيء إلا أن تتقوا منهم تقات ويحذركم الله نفسا وإلى الله المصير قل إن تخفوا ما في صدوركم وتبدوه يعلمه الله ويعلم ما في السماوات وما في الأرض والله على كل شيء قدير يوم تجد كل نفس ما عملت من خير مهضرا ما عملت من خير مهضرا وما عملت من سوء تود لو أن بينها وبينه ومد بيضا ويحذركم الله نفسه والله رؤوف بالعباد we have repeatedly recited these verses and uh, also the translations thereof. So I think uh, today if we skip the translation, there won't be any harm. You already would have remembered it by heart. Why I repeated the first three verses is because there are a few, a few points which I think should be brought up, to, brought to your notice. Shahid Allah, uh, let me see. Kuli Allahumma malik al mulke, totil mulka mantasha, watanzil mulka mi mantasha, watuizu mantasha, watuzilu mantasha, bayadikal khair, inna kala kulisha in qadir. In this uh, verse, there is one point to be noted that those people who believe in a predest in predestination they translate it as an arbitrary expression of allah's will qulillahumma malikal mulke totil mulka man tasha wa tuizum which means that god does not have to seek any reason why he should do it so because he is uh, the possessor of everything, he is the ultimate sovereign, so he may take any decision and there is no one to question him. <clears throat> as far as the questioning is concerned, there is absolute agreement that there is no one to question him. But as far as uh, this uh, connotation of uh, a decision of God without its relationship to justice or fair play is concerned, we totally reject it on the authority of the Quran itself. <clears throat> now, I demonstrated the meaning of Bayyadik al khair in application to the following verse, change of night and day, but I did not apply it to the verse itself in which you find this little mention, Bayyadik al khair God is the sovereign and possessor of everything. So he gives whomsoever the uh, mulk, that is the sovereignty, whomsoever he pleases. And takes away sovereignty or possession from whomsoever he pleases. Now this is a very, very... Uh, intricate statement in the sense that uh, if you give uh, divine authority 
to every change of government, then like the, in the olden era of the Middle Ages, Christian monarchs believe that they have divine sanction, so they are empowered to do anything. Then our position will be very similar to theirs. And the Holy Quran will give them the authority, all sovereign's authority, all right. For instance, General Zia has come and he has taken this position. He is Allah's resurgent. He is there to do things uh, for the sake of God. So his appointment would be justified under this verse. So this is a very difficult verse and this too should be well understood before we proceed further. Otherwise, this will lead you into many problems and difficulties. And particularly in the light of what I have already explained, if Shaya means desired thing and Manta Shah would obviously mean what you so desire. So here, in fact, the question of uh, predetermination comes, up, comes into picture. And it should be well understood before we proceed to, uh, um, under, to a better understand, uh, proceed to attempt understanding it in its true perspective. If predetermination means and if it only means that every act which we do is predetermined by God and is willed by God, every thought which occurs to us, whether we reject it or accept it, is predetermined. And if we accept it, then it is predetermined. And if we reject it, then it is predetermined. Then all the responsibility of everything in the world would be shifted to Allah. As such, this will also shift. So what harm if so much other things have been taken over by God in this, as ultimate responsibility, then a little change of governments here and there would not add much to the burden which already has been shifted to Allah's shoulders. So first of all, decide what happens there then you will come to understand this better. In reality, the laws of nature, which are God's creation, and he has uh, uh, positively uh, started a, a, you know, the cause and effect chain system here in this world, is a predetermination itself. The lawmaker is the one who determines Lillah al mulk and Lillah al amr they are two expressions of the same thing with slight uh, difference in emphasis. Lillah al mulk means everything belongs to God. Lillah al amr means every uh, uh, right of ordering about every right of decision rests with God because he is the Malik. So God has connected these two things and this is uh, very important for us to understand. Later on some one day I'll explain this. Why? Because this is the uh, tool in our hand with which we will solve later on the political philosophies uh, which have become so debatable in the modern times. But here, let it suffice that Lillah Hil Amr and Lillah Hil Mulk are very closely related. So whenever you have a possession, you are bound to create certain rules and regulations. And you are bound to see that those who break the laws suffer and those who follow the laws benefit from it or at least avoid suffering. If the laws are good and meaningful and wise, then this should be the result and no other result can be conceived. If somebody is a sovereign and he devises rules and regulations and laws, be it a democracy or whatever name you may give it, then if they are wise and well understand the nature of subjects to govern which they make the laws, then 
the result must always be good. That is the point. So if God is the sovereign in this respect and he makes the laws governing the whole universe and also the human affairs and human psyche, etc., then whoever uh, disregards those laws and violates those laws must suffer. And whoever follows them must receive benefit from this. This is a law which nobody can change if everything else given, which I have mentioned, is good. So the nut result of this is that a wise uh, conceiver of a plan of things and uh, the one who gives the law, his actions are good in the sense that if you follow his instruction, then you reach the good. If you defy the instructions, then whatever you be, be, uh, uh, believe, you, this is your own fault. Whatever you, you reap, this is your own fault. Not, not uh, the fault of the one who made those laws. So in this sense the, is this statement. This statement should be taken in the light of all this. There are laws of Allah operating in this world regarding rise and fall of people. And there are certain people who follow those laws and they rise to a degree I mean, rise to, to, to a position of sovereignty to, in, in their own respective measure of success, which may be very wide, may be very small, but that is neither here nor there. Kingdoms and sovereignty are distributed by God, not from nation to nation and person to person like this. They are distributed by God through certain laws governing these affairs. And those people who follow those laws may come up. Now, if they come up correctly, then, of course, goodness will follow. But if they come up, for instance, by violation of those laws, sometimes they also come up with the violation of those laws. Then we see that evil is spread. But that will not be attributed to God because they did not attain sovereignty through following Allah's will. So there are two types of sovereigns. Those who are good sovereigns in the sense that they had right to come into power and those who are wrong sovereigns in the sense that they did not have any right to, to come into power. So if you include both the types of the sovereigns in this verse, then there is no explanation with us. Then Allah will be held responsible for that and Allah would be calling it good. Then there will be no order left at all in the, in the whole uh, human affairs. So that is what I am pointing out. What Allah is telling us here is this, that I have made certain rules and laws which you must follow. If you follow them and then you rise to sovereignty, that is good because from Allah's hands only good flows. That will be good for you. But if you violate, that is not mentioned here. That is mentioned elsewhere. Then what happens? But incidentally, one can say that is also mentioned that those who usurp powers Allah, Allah's laws start operating in a manner that sometimes he doesn't discern. And then that power is taken away from him. So when you include that bit of statement into this whole uh, affair, then the things become to ease a little bit for us and become more understand understandable then the meaning would be, to, in, two, in two ways, we can explain this verse away. Number one, Allah means to say, if you follow my laws, which I have made, because malakiyat and making of laws go together, as I have proved it elsewhere, then 
if you come to power, then I'll, the, you will find it good because you address me as saying, Bayadikal Khair, whatever comes from you is good. And following those laws, even if you lose power, that will be good for you. Don't keep sticking to sticking to power. For instance, you find this in the advanced nations, the wise people of earth, like here in England. If they commit mistakes in running the government and they find that they can no longer hold that power logically and justifiably, they quit. And their quittal in this respect is always good. It's not a shot. So in following this line of argument, then things become clear. That what Allah says is, you follow my rules and regulations, I am the monarch, and you will be answerable to me. As that, by following my rules, my, 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 my dictates, if you attain power, that power will be good. If you lose power, that losing of power will be good. Secondly, as I mentioned earlier, it may mean that if some people attain power with, by violating Allah's laws, they don't stay much longer. Such people are bound to be destroyed. And they go away and other laws of Allah take, uh, come into operation. And uh, if they have been uh, um, cruel to others, other people come who are cruel to them. And uh, uh, the cause of effect chain takes over so that after every crime, a new criminal is born. And this system of punishment is good. Not that evil in itself is not good, but this system of reckoning and the system of punishment is good to give us wisdom and better understanding of our affairs and add uh, uh, adulthood to mankind. This phenomenon has been mentioned elsewhere in the Holy Quran, where uh, Allah says, Inna Allah la yugayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yugayyiru ma bi anfusihim wa iza arad Allah bi qawmin suwan fala marad lahu wa ma lahum min dunihi min wal that Inna Allah la yugayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yugayyiru ma bi anfusihim in another verse similar subject is discussed with one addition that God does not change, the meaning is, God does not change a people unless they change themselves. In what sense? The other verse throws more light. I don't remember that particular verse here, so I didn't mention that. But that is that makes it further clear. It says, Allah does not change the people whom he has bestowed some nema and does not take that name away until the people change themselves. So in the light of this, because Al-Mulk is also a name, it's a blessing of God, and as such, the meaning here would be, when Allah bestows kingdom to someone, those who follow, get, get a kingdom or sovereignty, through following Allah's rules and regulations, which are dictated by religions. For instance, the more dictates of morality and righteousness and what is right and what is wrong and sen the, the sense of right and wrong is duly, correctly understood and then people rise to power. Then the meaning would be Allah sees to it that they remain in power as long as they are good. Nobody can ever change them. So there is one guarantee here in this verse that those people who rise to power and serve the cause of the people of Allah's, of Allah's servants and their countries, etc., in the manner as Allah desires, and they don't don't change. That is to say, the sovereignty does not get into their heads. Absolute power does not corrupt them absolutely. You know that sort of thing. 
then Allah sees to it that their kingdom is never broken and they are given an everlasting kingdom. But when they begin to change, corruption begins to enter and they begin to ripen into uh, evil people, then Allah takes away their sovereignty. Now, that the first act is also good, the second is also, also good. If such a people who have become evil remain in power, then that is not good for the people, for the mankind. So sovereignty is taken away from them if they are bad. That, is, that of course, happens everywhere. I mean, initially, if they were bad, the sovereignty would be ultimately taken away from them, but in a different manner. Initially, if they were good, then they, they, the sovereignty will be snatched away from them. Now, these are the two different situations. Because they are very delicate subjects, I have to explain them further to you so that you fully understand. Because this verse is highly important for us in the modern times because the people who uh, attack Islam in, in the light of the modern philosophies and sciences will question you on these things positively if they... Um, I mean, come across these verses and begin to ponder over this. These are the questions which are going to be made subjects of discussion, of course. So we better thrash them out fully and truly understand their import. So as I said, two possibilities. One, people who have come to power with Allah's grace, that is to say by following his laws, they don't break any laws. They rise to power because they deserve by serving the cause of the people, by becoming popular, for instance, in democracy, through the right means, by not deceiving the people and being devoted, they would rise to the power. Normally, we see that such people also go away. There's no guarantee for their staying. And uh, one thing which this verse is telling us is, is different from this. What Allah says is, that such people, if they remain good, will not be removed. A sort of immortality can be gained here on this earth if you follow the, uh, the desire of Allah and the dictates of God, then people will not remove you. Whenever the governments change, you are bound to find there some change of heart and some change of mind or some change of practice of that government from the time when it came into power. They start getting corrupt. They start get, getting uh, changing things. They begin to sit as if they, I mean, begin to rule as if they were the real sovereigns and the people were no longer sovereigns. They ignore people's wishes and become dictatorial and despotic in their behavior. If when this begins to happen, then Allah's rules, of course, again, operate and they are removed. But if they don't change, then Allah will not remove them because if they are good people and they remain good and they are changed, then you can't fire at the end of this, bayyadik al khair. How can you address God a God which changes even good people, snatches away power from the good people. Because you snatch away power from the good people, so you are a good God. How can you say that? So it would become a self-contradiction. So therein lies that guarantee. This is what I'm pointing out. <clears throat> Once I advised uh, uh, some uh, people in Pakistan as well, they were very popular ones, and uh, they came into power uh, through normal uh, uh, democratic procedures. And because they were popular and they didn't do any rigging with the polls or anything wrong, they genuinely deserved that. After some time, they started changing. And when they started changing, they started also deceiving people. They came with different intentions and different claims and started doing things 
contrary to what they had claimed earlier. And also they started intending rigging of polls <coughs> at uh, various stages. Once it so happened in Faisalabad, for instance, and their Ahmadi workers were also, um, you know, very familiar with them, and they, they thought they would help us. And when they wanted certain um, objectionable conduct, some certain objectionable practices from these Ahmadi workers, I told them off. I said, no. We are only partners in goodness, not in evil. So they said, this is how people stay into power. This is essential. You don't understand politics. I said, you don't understand politics. I have been taught policy by Allah, by the Holy Quran. And the politics of the Holy Quran is that you stick to good and Allah will see to it that you are not removed. You will stay. And if you do not stick to good, then whatever you do, you are going bound to be wiped out of this face of earth now or later, because the Yadikal Khair, God has Khair in him, and he does not change hands in sovereignty as long as people no longer deserve to remain in power. Now, because this sovereignty, the word sovereignty is not only applicable to the material world, but initially, as I said, I told you, and more importantly, this word mulk applies to the heavenly kingdom prophethood and uh, people who are born out of prophethood and are given rise. So there is a lesson for us. The greatest heavenly kingdom came into being at the time of Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. Had those people who followed him remained good and pure remain sticking to the good values which have been granted to them, that is Nema or Nabuwa, it would have been impossible for the Muslim empire, spiritual as well as the material, to ever fade away. This was a guarantee against that. And today the world would have been a completely different world altogether. So when we find the Muslims in a very sorry state of affairs today, morally as well as uh, economically and politically, etc., then the only conclusion we can draw from this is that they change themselves and they no longer deserve all that. So the corollary of this Verse is exactly the opposite. If you believe in predetermination, then all the blame shifts from your shoulders to Allah's shoulders. If you begin to understand in the light of what I have said, all the blame shifts back to your shoulders and Allah is not responsible for anything which you do because it is you who do it and you are responsible for the change of hands and governments and in spiritual uh, predominance, etc. Now, there is a lesson for us to draw to, from this situation. We are going to repeat history in a manner that we wish only half of history is repeated and not the rest half, rest of the half. We have been reinstated um, in the spiritual kingdom with the grace of Allah. And if we stick to these values and be more faithful to Islam, then I assure you a immortality. There won't be any change whatsoever. The moment you forget this and you consider yourself to be, uh, you know, deserving of all this as if these things, which these namas, which have been given to you by Allah, were you uh, were your right? The moment you begin to think think of this or behave like this, then the process of deterioration would take over, and everything will ultimately be destroyed. So this verse is a very very important verse.
it deals with the rise and falls of empires, spiritual and, and carnal. And uh, the main secret is you have to be, remain good, that is all. Good in worldly affairs or good in spiritual affairs, and that is the guarantee. No other hanky panky, no other trickstery is required. So, this verse is a philosophy exactly opposite to the Machiavellian view. Machiavelli uh, thought that you can only remain in power if you are unscrupulously corrupt and, uh, and cruel. Although many people today do not believe in Machiavellian philosophy openly, but all the politics of the world is following Machiavelli. If you uh, analyze the situ political horizon of the world today, ultimately they believe in Machiavelli. They say he was right. You have ultimately to seek refuge in, in some, some sort of corrupt behavior, corrupt manners, corrupt attitude towards things. Otherwise, you can't survive this, this, uh, this world, this modern world. So politics has become another word for corruption. <coughs> Diplomacy has become another word for duplicity and falsehood. So if this is true, and I find this, this to be exactly true in the modern affairs, and also if this verse is true, then they can't stay. Do whatever they may. These people are bound to be destroyed and wiped out. Because according to the statement of this verse, if you have changed and you're no longer good, if you remain absolutely and, and, and permanently, then that part of the statement is not correct. So God has to change you for the sake of the people, so that an, a goodness follows your destruction. So therein also lies the message which I try to deliver during my tours, even particularly in Canada this time. And uh, they agreed, but they said, well, we can't do anything about it, <laughs> you know. Many politicians discuss this, and some were in fact uh, so deeply influenced by this Islamic attitude, which is very simple. As simple as, uh, as as simple as can be, yet it is so deep, so rich that uh, they were overwhelmed when I when they analyzed it and they understood the true impact of this, and they said, "Yes, this that's the only way out." But there is no way out, <laughs> you know. Here again, I have collected a tradition for you, which I forgot to mention last time, so I must tell you of this. We have heard so much about Ismayazm, the greatest name of God, the greatest attribute of God. And here is one tradition attributed to Ahadr sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whether it is right or wrong, I don't know. But here, the ism azam is mentioned not uh, as somebody's opinion, some scholar's opinion, but it is said that Hazrat Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once mentioned that that uh, great attribute of God with the help of which, if you pray to God, it will never be rejected, is in this verse, Kulillahumma malik al mulke, totil mulka mantashao. So, now it's up to you to derive your own conclusion. What is the ismayazm of God? But forget, don't forget the presence of the word Allah. <laughs> But you will say then, this word Allah is oft repeated in so many other verses. So also Malik is repeated in so many verses. Why should Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have chosen this particular? And also because 
در منصور فی تفصیل الماسور واز کلیکٹیڈ علامہ جلال جلالدین سیوتیز بک واز ریٹن مچ مچ لیٹر اینڈ نو اوتھینٹک بک آف ٹریڈیشنز ہیز بین کوٹیڈ اونلی تبرانی از کوٹیڈ وچ از آئی تھنک مور آف اے ہسٹری ہسٹوریکل بک دین اے بک آف ٹریڈیشن واٹ ڈو یو تھنک از اے بک آف ٹریڈیشن بٹ ریٹن مچ لیٹر Uh, on, on, you know, any narration which came their way, they reported like a history. So, I wonder if it is correct or wrong, but I thought you should, you should know it. Another tradition regarding this would be very much welcome by many among us today, because so many of us always suffer from one financial problem or other or another. So here seems to be a sort of panacea for them. Hazrat Maad bin Jabal is reported in, by Allama Mahmood Alusi in Ruhul Maani as uh, quoting it from Hazrat Rasul Akram Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that when Maad bin Jabal uh, complained of his uh, debts overwhelming debts to Ahadrat Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told him, should I not tell you, uh, do you really want to get rid of uh, these debts? So he said, yes, I do mean. He said, then you keep, go, please, uh, you recite the verse, Qulillahumma Malik al-Mulk, till inna ka ala kulli shayin kadir. And then afterwards, you pray to Allah in the following words. That's not all. First, you recite this, Inna ka ala kulli shayin kadir, Malik al-Mulk, and the full verse. Then you uh, pray, O oh my God, you are Rahman, that is the most beneficent, not only for this world, but also for the world to come. For the hereafter. Also, you are uh, oft repeating in your mercy and kindness, that is Rahim. And you bestow things on whomsoever you please and uh, hold your hand from whomsoever you please. Please remove all my debts. After this, it is said, if he prays in these words, then if there is uh, somebody is under debt to a degree as if his debts are uh, of the weight of the whole earth, whole, whole, whole earth, even then God would remove his debts. Now, I quoted this because I wanted to point out a certain tendency in the quotation of, in quoting of traditions of which you should be well aware and you should be warned against accepting everything without uh, examination and uh, um, without due caution. I have noted that the traditions which were collected earlier they have a very special style and there is a purity of style which one can say without any further investigation that that style belongs to Rasul Akram Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It speaks for itself. But those traditions which are collected much later, they have so much addition and embellishment about it. And the style of expressions is such that uh, there is always something within you which prevents you from accepting it as a whole. You, you begin to wonder if Rasul Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could have said it. The statements which are collected in the early part are brief. The statements to the same effect which are collected 
in much during much later period are large enlarged and 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 much more wordy now what do you understand from this it should have been the other way around if both if the statements were correct then it should have been the other way around when you are closer to the source then you remember more when you have distanced yourself uh, traveled away from the source then you remember less and less and those traditions which ab- appeared 300 years after or 500 years after they should have been very short and brief statements persons should have say i have forgotten all about it only what i remember is that this was the effect of his his instruction so if it is the other way round then there must be something wrong <clears throat> once i remember uh, in masjid mubarak rabwa somebody quoted a tradition which was very long and so well embellished although the subject matter was such that everybody wanted to believe it but i started wondering i said how can it be possible that rasul akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam would be describing all this you know things to the effect that when adam was born he was shown on the horizon name written muhammad rasulullah all over the horizon and then some when other prophets were born name one after the other prophets were named this happened and that happened and that happened it was a very very long story which had absolutely no evidence no physical real evidence in the real 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 world in the real life and the style was such as somebody else who you know who wanted to build stories you know past stories for that matter once uh, sat and started weaving these tales so later on i asked the same scholar where he had taken where did, did he find this tradition and it was reported that this tradition first appeared in islamic literature in spain 600 years after the demise of ahaz sallallahu alaihi wasallam imagine for such a long tradition which covered perhaps two pages full scape pages to appear after 600 years of rasul e karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam's demise and not to have been mentioned anywhere in earlier period so that tells you the the, the whole story so all those traditions which are reported by most of the commentators of the holy quran should not be expect expected in an accepted in totality unless you first examine them and truly begin to understand their uh, uh, you know their relationship with other uh, sayings of rasul akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam or the verses of the holy quran if they fit well even if they are longish even if they may appear to be doubtful if they don't contradict with his style or with the general style of, uh, of islamic teachings then you may accept it no harm at least a good thing you said which he might have said you know that's the sort of attitude but the moment you begin to sus- find these things you must suspect uh, something to be wrong there so rasul akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam couldn't have said something which uh, is is obviously wrong the whole weight of earth of of uh, you know the whole earth load of uh, debts will be removed if you say these words so this is how islam was ultimately turned into stories and tales by these muslims sometimes somebody misunderstood the meaning and misquoted but most often than not late in the later period there were people who were devoted to concocting to things and attributing to surah akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they enjoyed embellishing things and telling tales and uh, even early in the early period such people had started unfortunately to make their uh, presence felt in the islamic world an obnoxious presence felt in fact other imam bukhari quotes that once he pursued uh, the line of a tradition and wanted to trace it to the original living source 
and he traveled far and wide and ultimately he reached a place where an old gentleman was sitting in a you know in a, in a room I, I think it was you remember this pun no 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 i think he, he mentioned a sort of a recluse room underground like basements nowadays so he the man was living in a basement a sort of recluse who had broken all contact from the world and he had very large big white beard and a very impressive personality so hazrat imam bukhari approached him and said i am told that this is a tradition of rasul akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam which was related by you narrated by you to somebody of this name so he said yes yes sit down and you are you are right i i did it i narrated it so, so hazrat imam bukhari asked him further who reported it to you that is what i wanted to find out because between you and ahad sallallahu alaihi wasallam there is there is uh, about 200 uh, i when when hazrat imam bukhari came 200 years from rasul akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam i think but whatever the, the time was he said so many years have passed who were in between you and rasul akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said none so what do you mean he said i am making them myself i know if rasul akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam had lived he would have said things like this <laughs> and he said look here all this library the room full of papers and writings he said all this has been made by me and i'm so sure you know that uh, what rasul sallam's trend is and what he would have said so i'm spreading goodness there is nothing no harm so in the name of goodness if it had started happening in the time of imam bukhari what might have happened at the time of uh, alama mahmud alusi or uh, and others so out of love for rasul akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam they accepted unfortunately this material but out of love for rasul akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam we should reject because anything which is uh, which is deprived of common sense which god has given us could never have been said by rasul akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam and if they insist it was said then they should try it anybody who is under load of debts then he should go on taking debts right from right and left you know and start say a few words like this and his debts would be removed i mean this is absurd what i believe is that rasul akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam wanted to point out to the meaning of this verse qul allahumma malikal mulke tutil mulka man tasha wa tanzil mulka man tasha and wanted to point out that you follow the rules dictated in this and the philosophy mentioned in this then you will never go under debt and if you go after you know making your life subservient to the dictates of this verse making your day to day behavior and 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 financial dealings subservient to this verse then if even if you come under low a uh, load of, of of debts they will be repaid now the word malik is the key malikal mulk is a very important expression which points out that no illegal or unjust transaction should be made in finances at all you can't give of which you don't of which you don't possess potentially or virtually literally or metaphorically whatever meaning of a, a possession you understand things which you cannot possess or do not possess if you act as if you possess them then you are bound to suffer so some people's borrow beyond their capacity that is to say they want to become malikal mulk while it is allah who is malikal mulk and if you always remain within your capacity and borrow only to that extent which you can pay back then you can neither you can suffer nor the society can suffer under uh, neck breaking or back breaking debts 
what happens in the modern days is that nowadays they have applied these these you know uh, breaks to this free borrowing by uh, asking you to pledge some st uh, real estate against your borrowings from the bank now this is the principle involved in fact you can't borrow what you do not possess or the value of which you do not possess the moment you do it you enter a state where you can't pay back your debts so this lesson was taught by ahzar sallallahu alaihi wasallam to somebody and the rest was built around it you know by way of embellishment and a few words were added and said all right you do this and uh, the result would be that uh, whatever you borrow irresponsibly without regard to your own capacity to borrow that will be finished i mean that that load will be taken off by uh, from you by allah so such traditions again the lesson is should not be rejected altogether personally i am inclined to believe that there are very few people like the one i reported from hazrat imam bukhari but most of those who interpolated with traditions did it either through mistake by forgetting things and trying to remember it they remembered a few extra words or uh, they explained things away suggested things after mentioning a tradition that you can use this and you can use uh, use it in this manner and that manner like um, sometimes you find hazrat imam abu huraira doing the same thing and uh, sometimes the muslim ulama while debating certain issues with us attribute the sayings of imam abu uh, hazrat abu huraira to rasul ikram sallallahu alaihi wasallam to prove their point and then in response we tell them no it is here that the statement fin of rasul sallam finishes and it is here that the statement of abu, abu huraira begins now this we can do because those uh, uh, scholars of the quality of hazrat imam bukhari etc were very careful and if not one the other did mention that this is the the statement rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that statement is the statement of uh, uh, the narrator and not rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam but this strict application of uh, cautiousness is no longer found in the later period so things got mixed up even inadvertently i don't blame them all together as forgers because among them are very great scholars of uh, you know very high uh, station in islam it's impossible for you to believe that they forged things but out of love or whatever they thought they accepted material which they shouldn't have normally accepted but still it was woven round some kernel some central uh, statement of rasul ikram sallallahu alaihi wasallam so you should try to find out which that statement might have been this is uh, uh, this attitude is essential for ahmadis and if you understand this attitude then you can better uh, deal with the ahli quran as well the ahli quran are those who rejected the tradition in toto they said because of so many problems the passage of centuries then the interpolation interpolations misunderstandings additions subtractions explanations etc it's very difficult if not impossible to find out what rasul ikram sallallahu alaihi wasallam might have said so the easy way out is to reject all it all together and just stick to the holy quran and consider it to, to suffice once an ahli quran was debating this issue with me i said suppose i told you that in the sand um, by the bank of a certain river there is gold mixed in sand say by 1% or so will you just reject that in disdain and walk away and say because there are 99 particles of sand 
why should I bother to to reach one particular goal and do or go through all that labor? I said, if people, even with less percentage of goal, much less percentage of goal, have spent their lifetimes sifting gold from sand. So you care even less for Rasulullah Akram Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sayings, which are pure treasures. So it is not for us to reject it. If unfortunately something impure has been mixed, it is for us to find out the pure part and uh, go through all the labor which we can apply. Then Allah will reward you. And in the case of Rasulullah Akram Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sayings, also, there are mohkamat and there are mutashabihat like we discussed in the earlier uh, verses. I have found traditions which work as mohkamat. And in the light of those traditions, this work is made so easy of finding out which, what thing might have been said by Rasulullah and what might not have been said. So one should not reject everything in totality. Even the exaggerated, uh, you know, appear, those traditions which appear to be very much exaggerated, out of shape, on which if you work, you always find some reward. If not always, mostly you find some reward. <laughs> now, Tulajul Layla fin Nahar, Eva Tulajul Nahara fil Layl. وَتُخْرِجُ الْحَيَّ مِنَ الْمَيَّتِ وَتُخْرِجُ الْمَيَّتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ وَتَرْزُقُ مَنْ تَشَعُ بِغَيْرِ حِسَاب That you enter day into night and night into day in the sense, as we understand in English, in Arabic it's say, apparently it is said the other way around. You enter the night into day, that is to say you make the night disappear into day. So what results is the day. Immediately after it, it said, And you uh, provide provision, spiritual or material, to whomsoever you please, without uh, reckoning, without keeping an account, that is to say, unlimitedly. The scholars who have uh, discussed this have not mentioned, not to my knowledge, I have tried to find out, but they have not mentioned the relationship between the phenomenon discussed and Tarzuku Mantashaw Bagar Esab. They dis discussed the first part of the verse and finish with it and then they turn over to the last bit and finish with it but don't establish any relationship while there is such a positive relationship that uh, it is overwhelming and that relationship again was not known to the earlier man particularly the man of Rasul Akram's time had no knowledge of this relationship between night and the phenomenon of alteration of night and day and uh, risk, provision of risk. Now you can imagine this phenomenon of turning right into day and day into night also speaks of shortening of days and lengthening of days and vice versa. Gradually night disappears, loses to the day and the day loses to the night. This is also a meaning. This meaning has been mentioned by many earlier scholars. I mean, this is uh, a valid meaning through the Arabic expression that shortening of nights and shortening of days alternately, this phenomenon has also been mentioned. And then, you take the dead out of the living and living out of the dead. Now, these two things have a positive direct bearing with the system of provision. Remove them, 
and uh, it is impossible to conceive of a system of sustenance of provisions for mankind or for any life. Suppose this, uh, 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 you know, this declination in the degree of uh, the axis of the earth by 23.5 degrees had not occurred. If that had not been so, then the days and nights uh, could not be uh, governed by this uh, decreasing and increasing phenomenon. Then the situation will become completely different. And this is, there is no way here to demonstrate to you, but let me pick up this cup of unused kahwa. Now this, suppose this is the earth, this is revolving Uh, uh, parallel to the sun. Now, if it is revolving like this, the day and night will be exactly equal in this position. Exactly equal. If the um, axis is parallel, I mean. So, this verse will not operate here. Then what would happen? What wrong will it do to the system of provision? This is what we have to see. The earth is also moving, so it comes here. And as long as it remains in this position, there will be total day for many months, complete full day on this part of the earth and a complete full night on the other hemisphere of the earth. The result would be that all life would die out here and all life would die out there. When the earth emerges for the equal days here, after a while it will pass from this position after three months and then again enter. So whatever life was reborn within that three months period will also be totally destroyed. That is one thing. The other thing is that the, those people who know the natural geography, the geography which deals with the motions of air, winds, etc., and the changes of weathers, they establish beyond doubt that have that had that uh, axis not declined to a degree as it is, or even if it has deviated to a very slight from the, its exact position as it as we find it, the balance in nature would have been overthrown, and uh, the result would be that there would be no life possible on this earth because the weather will also be so eff adversely affected. The motions of the winds and their carrying of uh, certain temperatures from one region to the other, and there are so many factors involved which the scientists have calculated. And they say this is the, just the right inclination of the axis, there, whereby this change of day and night is born and uh, which is responsible for our um, sustaining system here on this earth. And as far as the turning of life from death and death from life is concerned, this is also highly important. People think that what is important is to, to turn the life from the dead. They forget that if it was a one-way one -way road, after a while we'll be left without provisions completely entirely. <laughs> the other system had to be born along with it, not accidentally, but to a degree that they exactly equaled each other. So totally well balanced that ultimately all the uh, sources remain as if untapped. And this re-entry a recycling of life into death is well governed by uh, laws of nature which are very intricate and very wide in, its, in, in their operation. And they create a balance in life which otherwise would have become impossible. Now, 
this is a very interesting subject. I'm proposing to enlarge this subject during um, my addresses on the existence of God in some places later on. So I won't uh, take more of your time now. But I assure you, this is a very interesting subject. Those MD students who know ecology and who know something of biology, etc., and chemistry, organic and inorganic, they will find this very interesting. That had the laws for turning life into death not been extensively made, there would have been no possibility uh, of, and no guarantee of uh, getting a provisions for uh, sustenance and survival. So this is why God says, and you provide uh, uh, to whomsoever. Now the word provision is directly related. Why does he say Bagare Hisab? And what does it mean, Mantashav? The fact is that the previous uh, uh, um, natural phenomenon which has been mentioned, which is responsible for the uh, uh, system of provisions, is well uh, accounted for and well balanced. You can't call it Bagare Hisab. A thing which is based on strict mathematics cannot be called Bagare Hesab. Everything is measured, everything is well balanced. You do this and get that much amount. So there is no question of Bagare Hesab here. If you sow seeds and follow the laws of nature, according to a mathematics which can be applied, you can get the maximum to that and the minimum to even to zero sometimes. But there is a mathematics employed every time you try to multiply your provisions through, by, by following the laws of nature. So why does Allah say, Bagare Hesab? What does it refer to? Now, there is one, one reference is to a mathematics which is unknown to us. And that is to say, every time people, when calculated, how long shall we survive with the available uh, sources of uh, provision? Even in the, many hundred years ago, when they pondered over these questions, they calculated, and according to their calculations, the world would have come to, to an end by this time, or before early, even much earlier and you extend the calculations backward in history, and the provisions should have got uh, completely exhausted much, much earlier. So if you go by Hisab, which we know, we, uh, we, we simply can't <laughs> guarantee for the survival of any life here on this earth. So Bagare Hisab, to our reference, in, uh, in Allah's knowledge, there is a hisab, of course, for everything. With application to us, it seems that we are being given bagair hisab. Because uh, this, uh, what is the, the theory? Ma Marshalls? Uh, Malthus. Ma Ma Malthus, yes. Malthus's uh, theory of uh, progression of, of, of life and the progression of provisions in relation to each other is so frightening that uh, if that theory were correct, even today we, we, we might, might have run out of our provisions al al already. But as we reach this stage, new sources of provision are appearing before us more and more and more. Now we have learned to live in the heavens. That is a very significant breakthrough. We have learned to live under the ocean surfaces, deep down in the, in the, in the, in the, on the bottom of oceans, like Japan has already done. And we have learned to uh, convert food from uh, algae found in the sea, which were considered to be previously totally unfit for human usage, and nobody could conceive of deriving anything from it, now you can find meat prepared from those algae. And uh, 
we are being ushered from one stage to another, but at every stage, we, according to human calculations, the mathemat our mathematics should tell us that that is the limit and after that no survival. So as we see it, we see that God is doing it bhaghaira hesaab. His mathematics doesn't come to an end at all. It knows no boundaries. It goes on increasing. So that is one meaning of bhaghaira hesaab. The other meaning is uh, applicable to the spiritual world. There, actually, literally, by both, uh, by, by the application of both our standards and God's standards, what He rewards us is Bhagare Hesab. Our good deeds here are limited, small. Also, unfortunately, they're not perfect in most cases. And the reward is an unending heaven and a life of ease and peace and Allah's love. Now, what relationship is there between the labor and the reward? No, none whatsoever. So, it is bhaghaira hesab. Now, you again turn in the light of this and turn back to the material uh, world and then you suddenly begin to see that here also you are being provided bhaghaira hesab. In this sense, that whatever you put in as your labor, what you derive is far more than what you should have been given. So Allah gives you f not a to the mayor of your in according to the mayor of your labors, but in this sense. And then you go back into history of mankind before mankind was ever even born came into being. Then you begin to see that you are given those things in which you did not play the least part. You could not play because you were not born. You are not existent. Even a billion years ago, even more than that, things were prepared for you by God in whose making you could not have taken any part whatsoever. So where is the hisab? Tell me now. Where is the hisab involved of labor and reward, application of, of mental qualities or physical qualities and the result thereof. Nothing whatsoever. So suddenly what emerges to us is that both the world here is Bagare Saab, the world of provision, and the world in the uh, of the hereafter also is Bagare Hesab. So I think for tonight that should suffice. The day after tomorrow, inshallah.